Hello and welcome to Rajya Sabha Television. You're watching The Big Picture with me, Frank Rajan Pereira. The Lebanese government has resigned amid growing public anger following a devastating explosion in Beirut on the 4th of August that killed at least 200 and injured about 5,000 others. The blast came at a difficult time for Lebanon, which is not only trying to curb the spread of the coronavirus, but is also mired in an unprecedented economic crisis. The economic situation has pushed tens of thousands of people into poverty and triggered large anti-government protests. In this edition of The Big Picture, we will analyze the blast in Beirut and the impact it has had on the country, the region and the world. Joining me on the program today are Anil Trigunayat, former ambassador, Professor A.K. Pasha, Center for West Asian Studies, the JNU, and uh, Dr. Wai Lawad, West Asia expert. Thank you to all my guests for joining me on this edition of The Big Picture. All right, Ambassador, let me start the program with you first. You know, the kind of impact that the blast has had. Of course, Lebanon was going through a difficult phase, but, uh, you know, the blast seems to have just boiled over, spilled everything over, and the scales have been tipped on the other side now. Yes, you are so right. In fact, this was said to be uh, the biggest and most powerful non-nuclear blast in several decades. And uh, it has created, I mean, unprecedented uh, disaster like any war uh, happens. I mean, uh, more than 300,000 people are really homeless today. And uh, about 200 people died and uh, more than 6,000 people were injured. They are still uh, searching. At the same time, the country has has been very unfortunate in many ways. I mean, for several years now, they have had civil war, they have had uh, invasions uh, by Israel, by Syria at one time, invited, and then the interplay of uh, uh, the French and the others, Saudi Arabia. So the country has been facing the civil war-like situation for a very long time. Moreover, the economy of the country has been growing down. There have been problems of corruption. There is. Uh, the the problem of uh, lack of entrepreneurship also i mean the the uh, people don't get the opportunities and then when you are in a warlike situation become uh, sandwiched into uh, uh, this kind of a state this becomes increasingly difficult and the <clears throat> lebanese are very uh, well known entrepreneurs all over the world wherever you go they have done extremely well and they are very well attached to the, their country and it's a country which in my view was used to be known as because of its financial institutions and banking institutions as uh, 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 Switzerland of the East, or for because of its beauty and brilliance, it was called as the Paris of the Middle East. I mean, and it's an absolutely fabulous country, strategically located, uh, yet uh, it has gone through this kind of a downturn, and the people have really become very frustrated with the inept governments. Now, this is also due to uh, the kind of political system that they have uh, really devised for themselves, uh, which is based on confessions. I mean, the President has to be this from Maronites or uh, the <coughs> uh, the Sunni should be the uh, prime minister, the speaker should be Shia, those kind of things. I mean, that is when you have this situation, then it is very difficult to form the government. So, after the 2018 elections, I remember I visited uh, Beirut and our ambassador uh, could not uh, present his credentials, or for that matter, the, the Lebanese ambassador could not be appointed. So, things have really become difficult. Moreover, the problem is that they had a problem with Saad Hariri, as you know, that the previous uh, the prime minister had some problem in uh, Saudi Arabia. So all these things have been boiling over. I mean, the people want things to move. And this Arab Spring kind of a thing has continued. And I think there's a second wave uh, that has come in. And now this particular blast has actually given them the trigger. Right. So the people saw the inept handling. They saw that this kind of huge quantities of unclaimed um, uh, nitrate was lying there in uh, without any uh, you know proper custody or proper precautions. So obviously, then who do you blame for it? You blame the government. I mean, if the government doesn't know that in the half a kilometer from your office you have such a huge quantity of nitrate lying there, which could be devastating. I mean, and especially when you are having problems with the neighborhood. So anybody can trigger it. So that is why I think that the people have found the way and that I'm glad that the government has actually resigned because it was really doing nothing uh, uh, in the since it took over. It was ma made in such a way that it could not do much in my view. Right. So I believe that the people are going to 
uh, rise and I hope that the international community does not attach too many conditions when it provides the kind of assistance that is needed at the moment. All right. Professor, let me bring you to the picture now. You know, there was a, if you look at the last two decades, there was a brief period in between, I think between 2006 and 2010, when the Lebanese economy was doing decently well, growing probably at uh, almost double digit figures. But post that, we've seen the economy, you know, just dive down completely. So what has gone wrong really as far as uh, Lebanon's economy is concerned? What can we attribute to what the Lebanese economy is going through right now? Yeah, the Lebanese uh, state and its economy are intrinsically linked with the regional economies. Uh, and uh, Lebanon has been a victim of uh, foreign intervention from almost uh, all countries in the region, apart from the global uh, major players, from Israel to Syria to Iran to Iraq, Saudi Arabia, UAE, Turkey, all have dabbled uh, uh, in the internal affairs of uh, Lebanon, with the result uh, when Saudi Arabia took upon itself as a supporter of the Hariri family, Rafiq Hariri, he got billions of dollars of financial aid from Saudi Arabia, both public and private, and from other rich Gulf countries, which uh, fueled the economic development, which was necessary because after the civil war uh, in the 1980s, 89 when it ended, you know, there was not much of development. So it accelerated during the period it, which you have uh, mentioned. And uh, Lebanon uh, prospered. Uh, even though it had to face a war in 2006, uh, which led to Israeli attack uh, on Beirut and devastated uh, much of its uh, economy. And uh, this pouring of resources from uh, Iran to Gulf countries and the diaspora, large uh, Lebanese diaspora of Maronites and uh, Sunni Shia, they also poured billions of dollars uh, to make Lebanon what it was before the civil war in 75. So uh, all the actors thought that uh, Lebanon can be rebuilt uh, to its uh, former glory uh, and uh, see it as uh, a very attractive place uh, for uh, not only tourism, but also for uh, entrepreneurial skills, uh, because every Arab could come and invest in almost all sectors there. That's how, uh, you know, it saw pumping of uh, resources from the regional actors primarily and also the international actors from China to Russia to America, European Union, all of them, they thought that uh, Lebanon should be a model uh, country uh, in the region, just as uh, it prospered in the 50s and uh, 60s until it was devastated during the 75, uh, uh, 89 uh, civil war. But the problem with uh, Lebanon is, you know, uh, the weak government, uh, there, uh, based on sectarianism, which the ambassador very ably articulated, you know, is because of the uh, French imposed constitution. Apart from Japan, Lebanon is the only other country which has a foreign imposed constitution way back in 1924 during the mandate period. And during the mandate and up to 1948, uh, you know, the French ruled through emergency powers because. Uh, they had created a greater Lebanon from a small Lebanon of Christian minority Maronites based on the Mount Lebanon area. So they expanded, took away much of the Syrian Sunni dominated areas and attached it to Lebanon, uh, which led to this uh, problem because uh, the, the, the French expected the uh, Syrian Muslims to leave the territory and go back to Syria, just as the Israelis expected the Palestinians to leave the Palestinian territory and go back and merge in the Arab territory. So the root cause of the problem, like the British who created the Palestine problem, the root <coughs> cause is uh, created by the uh, French, and that has got inextricably linked with uh, its uh, ambitions in the region, and it has become a, a free play. Uh, for all the regional actors, uh, the Egyptians were dominant in the 50s and 60s. Then, of course, uh, after the Iranian revolution, Iran came into the picture to prevent the division of uh, Lebanon. Syria intervened there officially in 75. So almost all actors uh, have, uh, in one way or the other, uh, 
you know, intervened and uh, brought this situation. And uh, the emergence of Hezbollah in the 90s, uh, uh, mainly because of the Israeli invasion in 1982, uh, uh, you know, has uh, become a source of resistance. Right. Because uh, Hezbollah is seen as a powerful actor which got the Israelis out in 2000 after its uh, invasion and occupation. So now the Israelis and the Americans and the others are trying to articulate the grievances of the Lebanese, uh, putting the blame on Hezbollah as the real culprit, whereas it is a defender because Lebanon doesn't have a strong military to defend against a military superpower like Israel. So, so in that second. way, you know, the, the articulation uh, of the demands, uh, which are basically very modest of the Lebanese, but it has got inextricably linked with the Palestinian refugee presence there. Then now the Syrian refugees in Lebanon and uh, its geopolitical importance to major players uh, in the region and beyond. Right. So there are several aspects there attached to, you know, the present situation as far as Lebanon is concerned. We'll talk about the region and the uh, other external players in just a bit. But before that, let's talk about the government and the political system. Mr. Vailawad, you know, as far as uh, the government is concerned, we've seen, I think, two governments in less than a year's time. In 2019 is when the uh, 2019 ended. The previous government, of course, stepped down. Now we have the new government, too, stepping down. So, you know, why did the government resign first and foremost and how difficult is it for the government or the political class to function in Lebanon? Thank you. And I think after listening to both the distinguished guests, I would like to add a few points here before I answer your question, which is a very important that the uh, 100 years of creation of, uh, of Lebanon, uh, Republic of Lebanon was done after the collapse of the uh, Ottoman Empire. And then the, during the occupation of France, of Syria and Lebanon, they have encarbed a lot of the Syrian territories. And if you look at the map of between Syria and Lebanon, you will be surprised if you look compared to the other maps of the Arab world, where it is actually a zigzag because the French used to take a village of Christian, keep the, Christ, the Sunni in the other side. So it was a zigzag kind of a border between the two countries. And we were anticipating in the near future that this crisis will will be uh, culminating because the, the French tried to make uh, a Christian's uh, uh, majority state, which is called Greater Lebanon, during their occupation, and there where the problem have started. So the civil war in Lebanon have created a kind of, uh, you know, 17 years of fighting, inter-fighting among different groups, have also led to the Taif Agreement, which was signed in 1991 in Saudi Arabia, and they came up with the new government, which is a sectarian democracy, where they have had that structure of different uh, sect that they can so so ultimately what i'm trying to say here any country has been created throughout history is actually meant that this is the end of it will end up because there is no way you can settle that that's where you have most of the countries have really involved in the regional player and international players have played a major role in destabilizing this small tiny country and i will add one more point which is very important to all of us to understand the root of terrorism which have started after the invasion of Iraq by the United States where Al-Zarqawi had a quite activity inside Syria and Lebanon and he was bombed with the Gulf money into the region where he has created, you know, a, a new way of of buying uh, uh, terrorists and, and, and Takfiri group which have been flourished inside Lebanon. So Lebanon was Hezbollah, the national resistance to the occupation of Israel, was created because of Israel occupation. Therefore, to counter the Shia uh, power in Lebanon, the Sunni movement have come into Lebanon and they have been created. And that's why you see now Turkey is stepping in, France is stepping in for the Christians, and Saudi Arabia and Qatar also pumping the money to their, to their Sunni uh, supporters. So the fact of the matter is that the government of Lebanon is totally, the whole official system of Lebanon, it totally corrupted. Rafiq al-Hariri, when he was brought to Lebanon, Lebanon had only $5 billion debt. Now Lebanon having $90 billion debt. So where this money goes for? Therefore, it gives you a clear picture how much corruption have intervened inside the system. And thanks to the corruption, actually, Frank, I must say here that the corruption in Lebanon have made half of the nitrite which was stored in Beirut, being smuggled into Syria and bombing Idlib, bombing the, the public property, the hospitals, the government, the people. It's all because of the nitrite which was stored in unknown on mysterious ship, 
landed there and because of corruption kept there. So when the government of Lebanon has been collapsing one after the, act, the, the other and a successful government of Lebanon refused to take this decision, a new government where the people start projecting that this is a face of Hezbollah government because Hassan Diyar was supported by Hezbollah government six months within their taking over. He was trying to understand what is this nitrite doing there. So we suddenly, after they appointed the officials to deal with it, one of the major general was assassinated. And then we have suddenly, when they have started visiting the port to find out, the whole things blew up. What is happening in Lebanon is a clear picture that the American, the West, the Israelis, everybody is a culprit of a first crime, a uh, humanity crime against humanity, a crime, crime of first degree. So Lebanon is a victim of the regional players of the internal because we used to say it is external power that have been influencing the policy of Lebanon. But the fact of the matter, this bomb have really exposed the internal corruptions and the scan of worms have come up open to show how much this country is trying to destabilize. So therefore, there are, uh, I think the regional element and the wider perspective of it is to look at it from different angle, where you will see the Lebanese now is heading toward again because there are some people in France or in the West think that the remnants of colonial power, that they can come back to Syria and Lebanon and say, OK, <coughs> this is a mandate. We needed an international protection and right to protection at the so on and so forth. So Turkey has a new element stepped in to support the Sunni now. France came to support the Christians and then Iran is supporting the Shia. So again, we are in the quagmire of a war in the Mediterranean for two reasons. One is that there is a discovery of gas and oil in the Mediterranean where the Lebanese shore having two thirds of it and Israel is forcing Lebanon to have the maritime border, which they have refused. Second is Hezbollah and the resistance forces. They have failed militarily to remove it. So therefore, if you now go back to civil war, you will have a reason to destroy Lebanon again and remove and dismantle the power of Hezbollah. These are the two issues which is main. And for the United States, including these two issues, is the dominance and security of Israel is of a prime importance for them. So any government of Lebanon will come. It has to, to be accepted by the international community. There is no question of a government of Lebanon come, uh, you know, uh, of uh, technical technocrats and all. Because what happened is, it is the system set up in such a way that the Sunni will vote for the Sunni, the Shia will vote for the Shia, and the Christian, and so on and so forth. So how you will have a new government where the same faces will come back again? So therefore, palliative treatment of Lebanon is meant that to destroy this country. So there is a point of interest of other. Look at Turkey stepping in now and saying, I'm giving the nationality of the Turkoman to come to, to Lebanon and to, uh, from Lebanon. And uh, France will go to the Christian. So basically, you wanted to create a small canton Gitos inside this part of the world to make it more of a hard takfiri Sunni group around where the Christian ran away, where minorities ran away, and then you have another reason that you recolonize this part and the people of the region should not have any time of relaxation and stability and prosperity. Okay, points taken now. Let's, uh, uh, let's take the discussion forward and talk about the region and what, you know, all of this means for the region as well. But I'm going to ask all my panelists to be brief going forward. We've got limited time on the program. We spent a lot of time in our opening remarks. So, Ambassador, what does this mean for the region? Well, this is also a continuation, in my view, of the overall frustration at the popular level in the region. But the region has many other things. For example, there are regional hotspots that are still not addressed. You have the Yemen war is still going on. You have the blockade between uh, Saudi Arabia and the other four countries uh, for Qatar. That is still continuing. The Iran and Saudi Arabia, Iran and US conflict is still very much there. Palestinian cause is still uh, simmering very hard. So the, the whole of the region is continuing in a very difficult manner. Now, in this situation, what is happening in Libya and Syrian war, we know what is happening in Syria situation as well. But what I feel is that this is going to remain unstable for some time more. And Turkey, as um, uh, Dr. Awad also said, is becoming a new major player in the region, whether it is in Libya intervention or whether or uh, we are looking at it even in Libya, where I mean, I was there during the, uh, the revolution. But today, 
every this has become a free for all for everyone for the last decade or so so there are greater external interventions the new uh, power equations are emerging you know basically israel is coming a little bit more closer to some of the uh, sunni arab states like saudi arabia uae bahrain and uh, oman and we have uh, the, the the turkey china uh, pakistan russia and there that kind of uh, group is again emerging uh, which could be uh, for the counterweight us seems to be withdrawing from the region but at the same time playing a negative role not a positive role we hope that after the november elections there may be a rethink of their middle east policy and that could bring about and of course covid-19 is going to have a greater impact on the whole region and uh, so the whole economies are going under so that is something that is going to have a major impact for times to come right you know professor very quickly so is this another theater really as far as the uh, turkey and saudi arabia rivalry is concerned yes it is yes, not just saudi turkey arabia. and uh, saudi arabia but iran but the principal uh, actor foreign actor which is destabilizing uh, the peace security and stability is uh, its neighbor uh, israel because israel invaded in 82 and uh, it expected lebanon to sign a peace treaty like egypt uh, and jordan have signed but because of the unresolved golan problem with syria and syrian influence in uh, lebanon you know the situation could not go in the direction of uh, israel and the west so since 1982 it has been a tug of war between lebanon and israel both trying to uh, impose their uh, views you know we saw the 2006 uh, israeli invasion that was uh, aimed uh, to decimate hezbollah like they did 82 to decimate uh, the plo uh, which uh, did not uh, solve the problem because there are huge number of palestinian refugees uh, there and uh, israel has been targeting uh, lebanon and after the syrian uh, support to uh, sorry the iranian support to hezbollah and to syria Uh, israel is alarmed that uh, you know its borders have become more insecure so israel is rampantly attacking not only targets in lebanon but also in syria in the name of preventing the flow of weapons from iran to syria and from syria to lebanon whereas uh, the actual reason is uh, to force lebanon to sign a peace treaty like it has done with jordan and uh, israel so uh, it is uh, the peace security stability and proper systemic functioning in lebanon is inextricably linked with uh, the arab israeli conflict uh, otherwise uh, the, i don't see any, any prospect of uh, peace returning to lebanon right so uh, while uh, let, let's talk about syria now because you know lebanon and syria share a, a, a huge border as well so you know the uh, last 10 years have been extremely volatile as far as syria is concerned too so how much of an impact has, is what is happening in syria had on what's happening in lebanon absolutely it's a major impact frank if in fact there are 45 syrian lost their life in this bomb actually and we have 2 million people on the border are related in both sides of uh, the family have been separated with the christians and the muslim as uh, against the sunni and the other part where they have been divided so therefore anything happened to lebanon syria bleed also on that so therefore we are at the receiving end of anything developing in this region particularly because of the terrorism also spreading and there was lots of influx of terrorist organizations supported by certain element within the when the within the official of lebanon into syria you know and they have inflicted a major blow to the most of the syrian uh, property and human loss in our life so therefore a stable lebanon is one of the prime important for syria in fact in nine, during the civil war it was the arab league which have given the mandate for arab forces to go but it was only syria left on that and that's why we were being accused that we have been not giving the lebanese their uh, peace uh, their, their stability but the fact of the matter it is two states of one nation so i can't go, go beyond that and i bleed my heart bleed for the lebanese and everybody who lost their life so therefore anything happening in lebanon is definitely going to happen to us and remember also that the, anybody fall on the line of the maritime of the silk route of the china 60 countries including syria lebanon iraq afghanistan pakistan and and, and even in iran all these countries are going to suffer because there is a wider perspective to look at the crisis is that the fighting between the united states and its allies and also the china and trying to have influence in this part of the world so therefore 
Israel is trying to have a new line of Haifa to Saudi Arabia. They wanted to avoid the Silk Road of Lebanon, Syria, Iran, and also there you have to look into those aspects of the crisis. So therefore, we are not in isolation for what's developing in the whole region. And I think what's going to happen in Lebanon after next week, where the verdict of the president, Prime Minister assassination, Rafiq al-Hariri, will also right. have an impact. And either we are heading for a civil war because the prime important for U.S. and Israel is to dismantle the power of Hezbollah. The, the deterrence power of Hezbollah have made Israel life a hell because Israeli generals used to say we are we are we fly over Lebanon in a picnic we fly over Syria as a hell now both the country have been destroyed so Lebanon remain with little deterrence and I think they will do their best to remove this deterrence out of the region okay. at the time cost get, of the people yes time to get closing comments go ahead professor you have raised your hand uh, the floor is yours yeah see uh, just to summarize briefly you see the Lebanese most of them who are young people who have been born uh, since after the Taif Accord uh, you know, majority of them are young people. They have become uh, tired of this uh, constitution, which has become non-functional because it is based on sectarian uh, division of government and uh, spoils. So what they are, I think, uh, common Lebanese are demanding is an end to this old political system, which has become, you know, which has lost its legitimacy and, uh, and non-functional. They want a, a normal constitution like any other written constitution, which allows uh, all of them to participate irrespective of the communal uh, association, whether there is a Maronite Christian or Greek Orthodox or Sunni, Shia, or Druze or so on and so forth. So the youngsters are earning for a uh, transparent political system because now it is based on corruption, warlords, tribal, tribalism, sectarian, uh, fiefdom, spoil system. All this has uh, brought havoc because it has allowed the regional and international players, uh, players to poke their nose and destabilize whenever they wanted. And the right. common people have suffered over the last uh, several decades. So they want to have a new political system which will give uh, and articulate their uh, aspirations and expectations. So, sure. Ambassador, best way forward. Well, I want to say that uh, what uh, Professor said is absolutely correct. That there must be a, a system whereby countries, especially the Western countries and Russia, uh, should agree that they want this country to have a normal political life. And to strive for it, they should provide all the assistance that is necessary. I just want to add one word that India has been present for a very long time there and in the UNIFIL, which is uh, the United Nations Agency on the Southern Border with Israel. Their Indian forces have been contributing a great deal to the stability uh, in the region. So I hope that the Lebanese will come out of it and uh, develop uh, like a normal nation. And uh, Wail Awad, close the show for us with your concluding remarks. Thank you, Frank. I think uh, the, uh, the issue, I fully agree that it is the resolution of a Palestinian state in the region and Israel have to realize that annihilation of Palestine is not meant that you destroy the access of resistance to your occupation and aggression and expansion in the region. And the more you will be able to protect this access of resistance extended from Palestine to Iran, it will be very difficult for Israel and its allies in the region where Saudi Arabia and, and some other, other the Gulf countries are trying to appease the American foreign policy in the region will not bring a stable region. What we need is a prosperity, coexistence, and also the right of the Palestinians to have their own, uh, you know, independent state within their own country and homeland. Okay, all right. On that note, then I'll call it a wrap from this edition of The Big Picture. Thank you to all my guests for joining me on the program and putting things into perspective for us. The situation in Lebanon at the moment is uh, dicey and it's very fragile is what the panelists are suggesting. We need to give Lebanon space to develop its own system and to ensure that it comes out of uh, this particular crisis on top and also it will help the region as a whole is what the panelists are suggesting. There are both internal and external factors at play right now. Let's just hope that things don't turn for the worse in the uh, months to come. With that, it's a wrap. See you again.